Bienvenido, damas y caballeros. Welcome back to Freeform Radio on the Freeform Network. Remember, send in those questions to ffnquestions at gmail.com and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Freeform Network. But again, this is Freeform Radio. My name is Daniel. My other host today is Andy. Still in recovery mode, but I'm back and uh, ready. Uh, just ready, I guess. Oh, yeah. Popped in some vitamin C and you're ready to rock. I'm ready over here. And uh, we got somewhat of a special one. Uh, we're doing another movie review. Um, this is a movie that actually I picked. Um, and we're, we're going to see how Andy feels about it. Uh, Noel's not here today, so we can't get his feelings for it. But we'll see where this goes and how it goes. Um, just quickly, Andy, some some quick uh, stuff about this movie. It is The Road, uh, based on the uh, Cormac McCarthy book. Uh, he wrote it in uh, 2007, it looks like. Uh, and he actually won a Pulitzer Prize for it. Really? Or, uh, or it was published in 2006, and he won the prize in 2007. So uh, the book, at least the book, was um, uh, a success, and it was uh, critically acclaimed. Uh, the movie, not, not so much. Uh, the movie was released in September of 2009. It had a budget of about $25 million, and the box office was $27.6 million. So not, not gangbusters in the movie theaters. Uh, barely made back its budget, but uh, as we all know, that's not usually... Uh, a good sign and not something that's going to be received well uh, if you just barely break even. They're looking for a profit. Uh, but it's in Rotten Tomatoes, it's got about an average rating. It's like 73%. And it's got uh, at least three notable stars. Uh, Vigor, the guy from Lord of the Rings. Uh, the kid is not too well known, or at least I didn't know him too well. Um and then you mentioned that that lady's recognizable, even though I didn't really know her. Uh, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie T- Theron, man. Yeah. I, I didn't know her from anything Eon else. Flux and uh, she's like the hot girl. She was in the Orville recently. Um, as probably her, Ch- Charlie Theron. And after Vigo, all you, everybody remembers Vigo from is uh, Lord of the Rings. Right. And then uh, Robert Duvall uh, played uh, the old man in, in this movie as well. Real so, quick, uh, the there's a guy, a, a father figure. Um, his, that's Guy Pierce. Uh, I just uh, looked it up real quick, and right. uh, Molly Parker is this other lady, the mom. Pi, she's more recognizable from Lost in Space. She's done a lot of TV shows, and Guy Pierce was like uh, the id actor for a while in the early 2000s. He had the Time Machine. He was in L.A. Confidential. Um, and obviously Robert Duvall, an Oscar winner, and he's been uh, in, in a lot of movies, Godfather, and uh, uh, no, he's Robert fucking Duvall. Everybody knows Robert Duvall. Right, right. So I guess, Andy, jumping into this thing, uh, give me your quick feelings uh, as far as the movie, because uh, you haven't read the book, right? No, unfortunately, I have not. Uh, when you picked it, I kind of remember watching it, but it's been, well, the movie's, you know, uh, what was it came out two thousand seven or whatever you just read off? Um, when did it come out? Yeah, two thousand nine. So we're at ten years. I kind of remember watching it, but I don't. Um, and then when I rewatched it recently, I was expecting it to be a little better with that cast. Uh, the director, I've not really heard too much about him. Um, Directed by Jen Hillicote, or John Hillicote. And uh, overall, I was kind of disappointed. Um, the characters, which is uh, another thing. That I don't know of the book if they have actual names in the movie. They're just the boy, the man, the wife. Nobody. There's only, I think, one person that I recall had a name. And that was the old man. And his name, his name was Eli. That's right. Yeah, all the characters... Are just uh, named the man, the boy, like the woman, names. the wife. Yeah, there's, right. uh, and I found that rather interesting um, when I first heard his name because the whole time I'm, as I'm watching him, like, well, wife, woman, boy, 
I'm like, well, what the fuck is going on here? Like, nobody has names, so I'm pretty sure that has some deep meaning. But um, um, overall, if you really had to push me, then I'm not recommending it. I didn't like the characters. I didn't like how the father figure, uh, Vigo, w- played him. I didn't like how his marriage was treated in the movie. I mean, he is a in the in the, in the movie him and his son. I, I see they're trying to build on that relationship, but to me, he came out as kind of weak. And um, the premise, there's some other questions as, as we delve into the movie that uh, I'll bring up. But overall, I, I don't recommend it. I have a feeling the book is way better than this because I'm pretty sure it uh, answers some of my questions. The flashback scenes were even kind of weird to me with his wife. And um, I, I just I I don't recommend it overall. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I would say pass. I'm just telling you right off the bat, guys, pass on this movie. <laughs> right. Uh, me on the other hand, I I did care for it a lot. Um, I think those points that you brought up, or at least the, the few that ring in my head right now, like the the no names, the kind of absence of information as to what's going on. Um, those are all things that really piqued my interest and wanted me to kind of fall into that rabbit hole to find out more information about this movie. So uh, like you, I had seen this movie uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, maybe not in 2009, but a few years after that. And it it really piqued my interest. Uh, I thought it was unique and different. Uh, so much so that I'm I'm not a reader by by any uh, stretch. So I listened to the audiobook of it, and even the audiobook. And I'm sure reading it would probably be better for you people that are readers out there. Uh, I read comic books. I don't really read big nerds. Two hundred and eighty-seven page, you know, uh, books. But I in the audiobook, it is a very well done book, and it. It goes into more detail, not as much as you would think, Andy. It just explains the world a little better, um, really puts the the circumstance that they're in with a lot more detail. And, you know, towards the end of the movie, you kind of get that rushed feeling like they're kind of rushing towards the end. And, and in the book, it really takes its time and it really goes into that ending a little bit more. But... The movie is basically what the book is. Um, It's just a shorter version. So uh, if you were looking for his name for the man and the boy, you're not going to find that in the book because it follows the the same thought process where the characters have no name except for Eli. And uh, supposedly that's uh, on purpose because, uh, you know, the the author wanted to have some kind of biblical sense to it. Yeah. And so he named the character after Elijah. So it's very unique, very different. Um, I, I I really dug it. I really dug it. And I think for um, parents, uh, more, more so, uh, fathers and mothers that have children, this is something that will ring very close to your heart. And it's something where you were feel empathy for the situation that the father and the son are in and you will be able to relate in a lot of the situations that they have. So, uh, you know, without dragging this on too much further, let's kind of dive into it. I'm just going to bring up some key points that came up in the story and then uh, we can have some quick conversation. Real quick, for the record, I am a reader. If you guys want to send your books, I'll fucking read them. And I love reading all sorts of books. Except yeah, yeah. Uh, nonfiction books, <laughs> right? I, I know you're a, 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 a is... big avid uh, reader, uh, more so than me. Uh, it, it, you know, it's it's something that I wish I was better at. I've tried to train my brain to to read big books, but uh, it's just something that my brain doesn't function that way. Uh, maybe it's more mathematical, and I, and maybe that's why I, I leaned more towards math. But real quick, uh, reading wasn't my strong point. I've I 
listen. I've tried to listen to audiobooks that are like eleven hours long. Have you ever listened to an audiobook that long, or is it usually like four hours or something? This one was uh, close to six hours. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the audiobook, and I, I've only really, honestly, done three audiobooks in my life. Uh, mm-hmm. The other one was kind of short. It was about two hours. Uh, so this is definitely the longest one that I've listened to, but it was engaging from start to end. And it really made me feel like following along through the book because it was the kind of thing that I, I heard like at work or on the road while I was driving to work or driving to some place. Uh, it was definitely in a quiet moment that I would listen to it. It's not like I had it in the background as I'm vacuuming or folding clothes or doing whatever I'm doing in my usual day to day. So it was definitely something that you had to pay attention just because a a lot of it is is narrative and descriptive as to the situation. So uh, definitely something that you have to pay attention uh, to. So let's uh, jump into some just some key points before the the start of the movie. Um, I I think the very start uh, in the book as well as in the movie, it's very weird how it doesn't explain what this bright long sheer of light is in the background. And in yes. the movie, sh- the movie shows that, you know, the, the, the couple are in the bed and then all of a sudden there's just like this very bright light in the background. Um, and then a few days after there, there's like wildfires uh, exploding through the background. Uh, but the book and the movie do make mention of the long sheer light, uh, as well as a series of low concussions, um, it's something that a lot of people have pondered what this means or what could have happened because the movie and the book don't really explain what happened to cause this situation. So that was another aspect of it that really intrigued me to really find out what was the meaning behind this and what was it that actually happened? Was it a a nuclear war? Was it, uh, you know, some kind of catastrophic um, disaster, you know, like Chernobyl or something like that? Uh, a media strike was some thoughts, uh, as well as the super volcano in Yellowstone erupting. So there was a ton of things that, uh, after I delved into the, the story a little bit more, that I found. Uh, what were your thoughts, Andy, as far as uh, the start of the movie, uh, without any explanation to what happened? Well, I just remember uh, that I got, he's like in some suburban life. And then, so everything's hunky-dory, got a beautiful wife, then he wakes up, and then, obviously, I'm like, uh, in my notes, I got a post-apocalyptic world, there's no sun, everything's dark, gray, and I'm just like, well, my first thing is like, okay, what the fuck happened? And eventually, in movies like this, you hear something happened, or people mention, like, you know... Oh, the Big Bang, or when we lost this, right? And you you start um, kind of piecing it together. Yeah, piecing it. Well, like something like that. We blow right. each other up, and early on, you know, going into it, yeah, I just like, well, okay, what the fuck happened? They were living hockey dory, and then some of the flashback scenes kind of tell you what's going on, or not going on, but you, when he's talking to the flashback scenes with his wife, he, you can see what kind of what what's kind of happening and um you know but the there's always thunder there's always it's always dark you never really see the sun it looks like it's cold all the time because they all got jackets and hats and so i'm thinking well maybe it's something climate or like some fucking meteor i hit and fucking blocked out the sun um but right off the bat you know something happened humans the world as we know it is gone and people are just out trying to survive Right, right, and and to as to this date, the author has never released what he meant or what uh, really was the catastrophic uh, event that changed the world. So it's always something that's been in speculation. But yeah, those are a few of the ideas. Uh, the the one that made most sense to me was the super volcano, uh, just because they they have theorized that if that thing would ever erupt, it's in Yellowstone that it would cause a a world-changing event where the sun would be blocked out with all the ash. And throughout the movie, you you constantly see ash falling and ash on the the floors. 
So when I read a little bit of that and heard a little bit of that theory, it really made me lean towards that could be what happened. Uh, but let's jump into the movie. Uh, there's a scene of the man and the boy traveling uh, with a shopping cart where they carry yeah. all their supplies and they pass over money and jewels. And what I thought was kind of neat is that they don't really put importance to it. They just keep wheeling their cart along. Yeah. I mean, again, right off the bat, like, like I said that, um, uh, you have this scene where everything's great. And then he wakes up and right off the bat, you see them. Like I, I got here a lot of walking and talking and you hear, uh, the man talking and they're just walking by stuff. So, our, you know, shit's, you know, the shit hit the fan and they're just, they're in survival mode. And so that piqued my interest. And I'm like, okay, let's see what happens next. Cause, uh, you just see like cars in the middle, of everything. And you just hear a lot of thunder. That's like something I remember a lot. Like it's gray. There's no sun. And there's just always constant thunder and guns firing. Right, right. Yeah, the the thunder was theorized to be like severe weather. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, like you and mentioned, cold. thunders. Yeah. And uh, because of the sun being blocked, the, the temperature is dropped uh, significantly. Uh, the other thing is where they're at at the time in the U.S. is expected or it's theorized that they're in like West Virginia, like the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, because in one of the scenes, they there's a, a map as well as the descriptions in the book kind of give that East Coast, uh, like Middle East Coast uh, U.S. where they start at. And uh, it, you'll find out later on in the in the movie that they're moving southwards. So I, I just thought it was unique that or kind of weird that they were passing over money and like jewels and stuff and not really putting too much importance because, you know, if there were to be a disaster, that would probably be the first thing that I would do is go try to take out as much money as I can from my bank account, you know, take whatever money I have uh, stashed around, you know, a couple bucks here or whatever, just because I would think you would need money to kind of survive. But here at this point in, in their survival of in this world, money has no importance and jewels and gold have no importance. Well, it's been like years um, when they're walking you know, another thing we kind of speculated, like, how old is this kid? So, because uh, th there's a scene where you see that she's pregnant. And so I'm imagining he's like between 10 and 13 years. So they've been living or walking or whatever for a, uh, a long fucking time. Right. And so that's why, like, so they're, they're like in desperate mode. They're in survival mode, like I keep saying, and they're desperate. So they're looking for warm shelter and like food. That's my thoughts on that. Right. I, I think the few places that I read kind of theorize that the child is more like seven to 10, uh, kind of a younger age, but yeah, I could see how the, the actor does look uh, more in his teen, you know, early teen age. Um, but I think the book kind of hints to him being a little younger than that. Um, after that, there's another scene where the man and the boy come up into a barn or some kind of shed. And after looking around, they, they find nothing but bodies hanging from the rafters. Yeah. So it's presumed that the, the, the family ha uh, had committed suicide. And this is like one of the first introductions as to uh, families committing suicide together and, and kind of dying together rather than going out there and trekking and trying to survive. So it kind of rings back to like you mentioned all these flashbacks that they have with the mother and you know where you'll find out later on in the story her her you know uh circumstance but it gives you starts planting that seed as to suicide being something that's viable for families you yeah. know that don't want to deal with this new world i you know when they were in that scene where um the wife makes comments something like uh, other families are doing it. Right. And, and like right off the bat, like doing what? Like I'm like, well, come, they, you already saw that scene. And to me, right off the bat, <clears throat> they showed to me his wife's like a quitter and not a survivor. And right off the bat, you're like, well, damn, did, she's not with him. So did she kill herself? What did she do? Did she abandon them? And... 
it, it kind of just leads into more like what did the, the the man do and he he makes comments like don't talk about it in front of him and all this other stuff and that right. scene so yeah it's kind of like and i don't remember if he in that scene where they see the bodies hanging if he's talking to his son about how to kill himself is that around the same time then yeah, that that's the the very next uh, yeah. little part. Uh, the very next scene, the man sh- shows uh, the boy that he has two bullets left in the revolver, ones for the man and ones for the boy. Uh, the boy ex- uh, or the man explains that the revolver needs to be pointed upwards in order for them to kill themselves correctly. Uh, you see the uneasiness of the boy as the man tries to comfort him uh, with this possibility, with this possible outcome to their lives. So, yeah, you, you get to see this uh, a little more, um, or at least the, the mother's aspect of it later on in the story. But uh, here, just like we mentioned, uh, it's the first really glimpse to, yeah, to families that, committing suicide. That scene right there where he's talking to his son about how to kill himself, I was just like, damn, this is kind of strong here. Like, I was taken aback by it because, to me, that shows kind of like, he's listening to his wife who's no longer there and then right. he's talking to him about this is what you're gonna do if you're gonna do it again and then we really don't know the age of the kid and it's a poignant scene to me i had not i had some issues with it like damn man this is kind of kind of graphic yeah it was really deep yeah and i was just like damn i don't know if i had a kid if i would have the boss to him like to me i was just personally like if you were any type of dad, I would feel like uh, wouldn't it be easier just for him to kill him and then him, uh, you know, blow his head off? Because to tell your son at that age to do that to himself was kind of rough, man. Right. I I, I would I think be I... more sympathetic to the dad if he killed him and then he killed himself. Like, because I you get that, but to tell him to do it kind of made me made the dad look like in a bad light like i'm like i don't like him you know and and i get where he's trying to tell me if i'm not here this is how you would do it right i i i see that um just because definitely for a father to leave it up to a boy uh especially him being maybe like seven or eight uh where he maybe doesn't comprehend life and death that well yet he's still kind of learning it's a, it's a lot to put in his hands, and it does kind of show that the dad is scared, you know, that the dad doesn't believe that when the time comes that he will have what it needs to, to, you know, you know, take his son out of this world, you know, if the need were to come. So it does definitely show the dad has uh, vulnerabilities and weaknesses, especially when it comes to the possibility of taking his son's life. It just goes to show in that relationship who had the balls because the wife's like, we got to fucking do this. You know, she is just like, I'm checking out. I can't do this. Like, let's all just fucking kill each other. And he's still fighting. And it right. goes to show the son is like his dad because his mom's is like, fuck it, let's just do it. And right. he's still like, I don't know. But he's yet he's asking his son, this is how you would do it. This is what you need to do when the time comes, which is fucking very strange, you know? Right. I think another thing to kind of keep in mind here that is in the book, the wife or, or the mother is very rarely mentioned. Uh, it, it's more so now in the movies that she plays a bigger part. I don't know if it's because of the actress that played her that they kind of developed the mother aspect a little bit more. But in the book, there's not nearly as many flashbacks as there is in the movie. So right. uh, the movie kind of, you know, develops her character a lot more than what the book does. Uh, but, yeah, the very next scene, it's a flashback of the wife giving birth. Um, and then the woman appears to be challenged. You know, she's having a difficulty after the child was born where you kind of see the, the husband kind of trying to, you know, ease her along into this new life that they're going to have to develop with the boy. Well, yeah, they already went through some shit. She's pregnant. And then, you know, so it just already tells you that uh, catalysmic, uh, the shit that happened went down already. 
Right. They're fucking right. worried. And then she's fucking knocked up. So it's just adding more of this like BS, like what, what the fuck we're going to do? And where she's like, that's what I'm saying. She's like a fucking quitter. Like she's by then she wants to check out. Right. Uh, right after that, you see your first look at to the hunters or the marauders. Uh, they're traveling, looking for supplies and foods as well as survivors. Uh, the men and the boy were sleeping in a van. Uh, they hear the noise and commotion, so they run for cover as the group approaches. Uh, there you see a hunter kind of walk away from the group, and he starts taking a piss a few yards away. Uh, this is when he spots the man and the boy kind of hiding in, in, in the leaves and the cover. So the, the man trains his gun onto the hunter, and then he asks him uh, one question. The one question is uh, what the hunter is eating. He replies... Yeah. Uh, whatever you can find, you know, while then he kind of takes a glance at the boy and kind of has a little smirk on his face. He got like a little smile, half smile on his face, uh, which kind of left me uneasy because this is uh, kind of when they start introducing, you know, cannibalism as being yeah. a, a way for groups to survive. So after a little bit more of a conversation, the, the hunter grabs the boy. Um, and at this point, he's holding a blade to his throat. So the man finally is left with uh, no other choice but to shoot the hunter in the head and use one of his bullets. So now the man and boy start running because now the, the hunter group is uh, running after him and trying to find him. Uh, that The boy is, is seen, you know, and he's in shock, you know, because he, the, the man just got killed over his shoulder as he was holding the, the knife up to his throat. Uh, they run off into the woods and the uh, hunters continue to look. And at this point, the, the man starts to try to comfort him because the, the boy is like considerably shaken, starts washing his head in the creek water. And, you know, uh, this is when the man has a, a really heavy point because he starts having like an inner monologue. And he says, uh, you know, I try to look the part of any common traveling killer, uh, but my heart is hammering. Uh, when it comes to the boy, I have one question. Can you do it when the time comes? So kind of going back to what you had mentioned, uh, this responsibility of taking the boy's life, it should really fall on the father. But here he's questioning whether he would have, uh, you know, the heart to do this. Yeah. Backtracking a little, there's a scene uh, before right where they meet up the hunter and they they're sleeping in that trailer. Right. And he, you right. see him like. He, the the kid the boy mentions like I wish our mom was with us and he told her stop thinking about her and then he walks out he throws away the wallet with her picture throws away her his wedding ring and he has a, a flashback scene also where right before you kind of figure out in the movie what happened to the mom she's like I can't do this shit no more and she fucking leaves him walking off into the dark. And then the last thing, one of the last things she says, uh, go south and keep the boy warm. And that's when you see why you why they're walking where they were. And, um, you know, again, they're, they're again, they're listening to the mom. And then the whole time the, the man's having, like you said, he's having these thoughts like where what the fuck do I do here? Someone already left me. I don't want to lose my son. But yet, he, right. the whole fucking movie's telling him like, "You're gonna have to kill yourself if something happens." Or you know, what you, you gotta, you don't want to get caught and be eaten. Basically, what I'm hearing because they, this is when they first introduce cannibalism. And right. He's telling him like, you know, again, more about fucking suicide. And I'm just like, and there's only one left now, and it's just like that. The whole back and forth, and then the, you're starting to see things with the kid. I get it. He's, the age is up for debate, but you think for he grew up in this life, you think he would be a little bit more tough, and I feel like the dad's been babying him, and like that scene where he's crying and like he's trying to like console him. To me, I think he should have been a little bit more tough. Or like, dude, like you start seeing it later on in the movie, like this is the way of life. Like you, you grew up in this. You know this shit's rough. Yet, I think he's still trying to keep him a boy as a kid as much as he can. When I feel like in that type of uh, 
climate and that type of situation there there is no time for that you gotta grow up quick because it's kill or be killed and the right. boy in the whole movie challenge it down the road he challenges them more because he keeps asking them i think they have a heart to heart are like are we the good guys here like or are we still good dad um and you know yeah i i, I it, agree it's i think rough I, I think it is a, a tough situation to want to keep your son innocent as long as you can. And I think it's a, a thing even in, in society nowadays that a lot of parents try to do. I mean, I definitely try to do that to my son, too. Uh, he doesn't know about paying bills and, and, you know, making sacrifices to make ends meet and stuff like that. He doesn't know about, you know, having emergencies arise where family members are ill and dealing with those situations, he's he's sheltered from a lot of that stuff. So, I think the father tries to do the same here. He tries to shelter his his son from the realities of the world uh, as long as he can, so that he can develop as a boy. And, and as the story, you know, eludes calling him the boy to, because that's what he is, and the man is called the man because he's the one that has to hold the brunt of the world on his shoulders while he lets the boy. Be just that. Be the boy. Yeah, and 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 I get that, but you know, it's a great point. That that's why they call him boy. <laughs> right. But I think, and in, in the way I see it, it's a disservice to that kid, to that boy, because like it's just the reality of the situation, and and some of the things he shields him from. I'd be like, take a good look, man. This is the world we fucking live in. And there's times where you could be compassionate like the kid is. And that's like, I, to me, that's the old way of, of, of living humanity, which they talk about. And they mentioned God and, and a couple of times down the road. But it's like you're shielding them too much, dude. Like you got to be ready for what the throw the world throws at you. Because as you could see, when the, the, those guys came, them guys ain't going to give you any fucking... Uh, any type of compassion and then one of the first questions is like do you eat what are you eating like whatever i find like and you can see like they're it's like it's a fucked up world man right right well i I think that's one of the other parts that i liked is that the start of the story shows the innocence of the child and like you alluded to towards the end he challenges the father a little bit more and kind of develops the character into what you're describing as to being more hardened and being ready to deal with the world but uh let's let's keep moving along in my notes i have that scene that you were describing andy being a little further on but maybe i i wrote it down in 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 a different order uh but uh, another thing to quickly to note before we move on to the next scene is that when the dad goes back to you know after everybody clears out he goes back to grab whatever supplies are left and you see like spinal cord in the background Mm -hmm. because they cooked the guy that had gotten shot and ate him because they're like, well, you know, he's food. So let's eat him while, while we can. Uh, but the very next scene is another flashback with the Mormon. And this is when they're, when she's arguing that, you know, they have two bullets left. She should have done it sooner. Uh, this is when she starts having that monologue that you were talking about, uh, her thoughts going as to, you know, they're going to rape her and then they're going to rape the boy, kill them and then eat them. Uh, at this point, she's like really angry and is commenting how uh, when the boy was bur- uh, born, that's when her heart was ripped out that night. Yeah, uh, what a comment, man, for a right? child. <laughs> man, that's like really cold blooded. And, and that's when you started mentioning that the man's like, hey, quiet down. Don't say this kind of stuff in front of the boy. Uh, so the man, it, it, you know, tries to um, get her to not give up and to continue to fight to survive. But at this point, you kind of start seeing where she wants to commit suicide and take the boy with her if she can. Uh, And and here's where I wrote down. uh, She says other families are doing it. Uh, The very next scene, the man has a talk with the boy. Uh, He claims they're not the bad guys and they they, or that they are bad guys out there and they need to be careful. Um, He reminds them that they need to continue to carry the fire, the fire that's inside of you. And then that's when the boy questions whether they're still the good guys because they killed that one guy and whether they would all always be the good guys no matter what, kind of like you had mentioned, Andy. Uh, after that, I wrote down, this is another little small scene in the movie, and it's actually a big part in the book as well. 
uh, where the man finds a can of pop and the boy, yeah. uh, he can't believe it. You know, he like takes a sip because I guess he's never experienced a, a can of pop in his, in his life. And he's like blown away by the flavor and the fuzziness in it. He actually burps and he you could see like a little bit of joy and happiness in his face. So I thought it was a very good part and uh, something that kind of puts you into the into what they're living through to where you don't even know the experience of right. know, a canned soda. So I thought it was pretty cool. Oh, uh, yeah, the, dude. The, the little things in that moment where the dad's digging. The whole time I'm imagining uh, this kid's like, what the fuck is this? And like what he hasn't experienced stuff that we take from granted in today's civilized and comfortable world, like a fucking can of soda. He never tasted it being how old he is because all he knows is what they're experiencing at that moment is uh, that's when I'm just like, man, that, uh, you know, that's fucking rough. And like, I'm glad I'm in a civilized world and there's plenty of fucking crappy food to go around. Right, man. You you just recently quit pop, but uh, can you imagine a world without even knowing the taste of it? Uh, there, I might be with the with the the wife, man. Like I can't live in a world like that, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but this is where I got that that scene written down as well, the one you kind of described earlier, where they they find a trailer to rest in. The boy, you know, states that he's hungry, and this is the first time that they kind of mention their intention to travel south, keep you know trying to go to warmer area and find more bo- more food uh the boy states that he wishes w- he was with his mother in other words he wished that he was dead too because uh the, the boy is aware that the mother is, has passed away uh the man tells the boy that he should not say that and he should forget the mother and this is where you see that scene uh where the the father flashed back to uh them playing piano and then uh kind of is heartbroken and is just struggling with the mother not being there, you know, while he's trying to give his son advice to forget her, it's tough for him to forget. So that's when he throws the picture of the wallet and his ring off the bridge. Uh, the flashback continues, and that's when you finally find out the fate of the woman, like you mentioned. Uh, after the man begged with her to to not go and to not go into uh, outside into the wilderness, um, he continue he continues to suggest to her just one more night with the boy you know what is he what is he going to tell the boy in the morning when when she's not there and this is when she finally you know gives up leaves her coat and walks out into the cold of the night and fades into the darkness where she's yeah, presumed she, to be dead she basically says i don't care or like I, it doesn't matter or something and i'm just like man some cold blooded shit right there you know they're just basically giving up on everything and uh, that that was a rough scene too, and I fucking I felt it just shows you that the man he's fucking weak and can't keep his family together. So it just that that scene right there also kind of struck hard at me. I'm like, I don't know why he would let her. Like, why don't he just fucking hit her, or knock her down, or like put some sense into her? He just. She 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 wears the pants in that fucking family, man. Right. I mean, you could kind of tell with the, or at least in the movie version, how he tries to pander a little bit his wife and tries to, you know, kind of soft step her a little bit and, and tries to be caring for her, you know. Uh, right. Maybe in a, in a kind, soft way. And you could see that the woman is, is having difficulties with the new world that they're uh, placed in. Uh, but the the very next scene is a uh, one of the few happy moments that there are in the movie. Uh, they find a rainfall, uh, a waterfall, where a, a rainbow kind of develops. So they they talk about it for a few minutes, and they're like in awe with the colors. He's like they, the kid didn't know what that was. Right. Yeah. He had never seen a, a a rainbow before, just because there's no sunlight. You know, it's always constantly dark. So it was a moment where they kind of you know, are happy in the moment and kind of walk into the water and play a little bit with it. Uh, but they, they continue on. The man and boy walk. Uh, they appear to find, uh, this is one of the other big heavy scenes as well, like an abandoned barn. Uh, they decide to go take a look. After the boy's reluctant, they find a locked door on the floor. You know, things just don't seem right in the scene. And as they go along, they find a way to break the lock, go into the basement, and in the basement, they find people, 
uh, people are stored in, in, in the basement, like food. You see some on the shelf. Yeah. You see some laying on the floor. Uh, and you even see some with, like, appendages cut off. Uh, they hurry out of the basement because right away the people start begging for help. They start kind of reaching for them to, to help them and get, you know, help them escape. But at this point, the man closes the door behind him uh, and kind of puts the table over there, over the, the door on the floor to kind of keep him in there. And they start looking for a place to hide because right away the marauders and the hunters, they're approaching the house again. So with the hunters getting closer, the situation really gets grim at this point. And the father, you know, they hide off in the bathroom and the father starts pleading with the boy to be brave and get ready for him to take his life with the remaining bullet. Cause at this point they only have one bullet left. So after begging and pleading with the boy, uh, the man finally sees no option and he finally decides I'm going to have to take my own, my, my boy's son, uh, his life. So the boy frightened and confused. This is one of the, the, the parts that I was just like, Oh my God, I can't believe this. The boy's frightened and confused, and he starts asking his father over and over again, when am I going to see you? What's going to happen after this? Will I ever see you again? And then after a few tense seconds, uh, the, the people in the basement, they finally kick over the door and start escaping and creating a commotion. And at this point, the man and the boy, they kind of escape out into the woods. And as the scene ends, that's when we see the boy asking the man if they would ever eat anybody uh, even if they were starving and the boy kind of reassures the, uh, the man reassures the boy that they would never eat anybody and they are actually starving at this moment. And the boy kind of agrees and he's just like, so we're going to always be the good guys carrying the fire. And, right. and, and then the, the scene kind of ends there. So this is a really heavy, intense situation. And I, I thought it was one of the, the better scenes in the movie. And it kind of showed the grim reality of, you know, the man being, you know, placed with maybe taking his boy's life. Yeah, that that scene, I was just like, yeah, that was kind of fucked up. So, <clears throat> but because there is no way he could ask this kid to, you know, to kill himself and shit. So, which is like a theme in this whole fucking movie about suicide. And, um, yeah, it was just, yeah, that was an intense scene when they had the people in the basement, like cattle and shit with limbs missing and shit. So, yeah, it was pretty fucked up. Right. Uh, the next scene, it's kind of like a, a little low point. Uh, the man and boy walk into the house where the man grew up in when he yeah. was a boy. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he tries to show him and explain to the boy where they used to put the Christmas tree, where they used to hang their stockings. And then he quickly realizes that the boy does not understand any of this because he's never experienced Christmas. Uh, yeah, as the, as I, I the, got it on there is that the, the kid didn't like the visit at all. He just thought it was like awkward as fuck. Yeah, I th I don't think he's ever seen his father in, in that place uh, just because he's always seemed like the strong man or at least to him, like the strong kind of uh, shoulders that the boy could kind of rust on. And this is the first time that you kind of see the man kind of lose himself in, in the right. in the moment. And I don't know if the boy got uneasy. So the boy ended up waiting outside. And this is where uh, you see the first sign that there are other children in this world because he kind of spots one in the distance in a window. Mm -hmm. So the boy, the boy starts running after him and kind of yelling out, you know, hey, don't be scared. Come out, come out. So the man finally notices what's going on and he starts running after him catches up to him and kind of argues back and forth trying to convince the boy that there is no children, no, no child, and, and that he didn't really see anybody. Uh, so, you know, it was kind I of sad. I thought the same to, thing, was, like, because he did say, like, hey, you're hallucinating, and I'm right. like, the kid did, I mean, I was like, is he starting to trip balls here or what? Because it kind of looked like boy slash girl to me so i was just like yeah maybe the dad's right he is seeing shit because they're starving right because at this point they haven't eaten in a while so it could have definitely been that um i kind of thought that there was a boy but the dad has been so disillusioned for so long right uh that maybe at this point he kind of just leaned towards there's nobody else out there that like, we're the only survivors except for all these killers so he can't fathom that there's children still out there. But the scene goes on. Um, the, the man and the boy seek shelter from the rain. 
And this is where you really get the first glimpse as to that the father is ill. He starts coughing. Yeah. And uh, the boy asks him, are, are we going to die now? And the man explains it. Uh, Do you think we're just going to kill over when we die? It takes a long time to die of starvation. Uh, but the man has another uh, inner monologue. And he explains that every day is a lie. And he is dying slowly. He is trying to prepare the boy for the day that when he is gone. So, uh, you know, I think the man is aware that uh, he has to raise his child to be prepared for the eventual outcome where he's going to die. But he does struggle with it, you know, kind of like you had mentioned that maybe he should be teaching these lessons a lot earlier in the boy's life. Yeah, absolutely, because he knows he's sick. Right. Uh, Here, there's another uh, little happy moment uh, in the movie that as they're searching a barn, they find a hatch in the floor. Uh, in the middle of a field and there's an underground bunker where they find food all the food that they could ever eat uh, they have a feast you know eating cheetos beans spam. all these canned fruit spam um, there's like all these supplies and here's where you see like the innocence of the boy kind of still in him and maybe this is what the man is trying to preserve in him uh, because he he's he asked his his father he's like hey should we give thanks to the people that left us all this stuff and that's when the dad is just like yes let's give thanks so uh even though the the boy doesn't know about religion he tries to put his hands in like a prayer uh you know kind of way and they do a, a small prayer for the people that left the food thanking them for all the supplies and stuff you should thank uh, those doomsday doomsday preppers for leaving them all them Cheetos and the spam and, and water, <laughs> right? <laughs> cigars and shit and wick, liquor. So I was just like, there you go, man. Let the somebody was prepared, but who knows what the how long uh, they died in there or what. But that I found that very interesting. People shit on those people, but you see when the shit hits the fan, those are the ones prepared. Yeah, those are the ones that are prepared, but. Uh, but yeah, that was an interesting scene. You know, people shit on Doomsday Preppers a lot, but uh, when you're thankful for even the kids, thankful he probably didn't know about no Doomsday Preppers, but somebody he at least he, he thanked them in the movie. Right, right. And like you mentioned, uh, the man finds uh, whiskey. He finds a couple cigarettes. Uh, has a couple smokes. Uh, they have a chance to kind of clean themselves, bla- bathe themselves. Uh, and, and at this point in the movie, you know, the kid is kind of soft spoken and uh, Junior was watching the movie at this point with me. And he even asked, he's like, is that a boy or a girl? Because his hair was so long that, yeah, that... It, it, he finally cuts his hair at this point and, and has a shorter cut now. And so then that's when my son's like, OK, now he looks like a boy because yeah. I guess before he had longer hair. And since he was kind of soft spoken. Uh, he seemed more like uh, like a feminine name, uh, voice, and with yeah, his long hair, he thought I'm he with, was a girl. I'm with Junior in this one. On my notes, I go. Uh, uh, they find food in the shelter, and they go down there, and then they're get, getting themselves clean. And then I wrote in my notes, "Boy looks like a girl a lot." Uh, and throughout the movie, sometimes, but here he looks like a girl. <laughs> right. So that's why I'm just like, I don't know what's going on here. But yeah, they clean, they bathe. Uh, the man uh, shaves a little bit, and uh, here's where the the good times finally end. Uh, there's some noises outside the hatch, kind of like a dog walking around or people. So it kind of spooks the man. So they finally just gather whatever they can carry. Uh, they get another cart and um, start trekking off onto the road again. So yeah, they they had the good life for like at least uh, a couple evenings. It looks like. Right. In the book, it's actually a lot longer than that. They, they spend a, a little bit more time in this area. And it's actually a, almost a whole town that's left over with all these supplies. It's like an abandoned city where, you know, nobody's touched it. So it's, it's wow. a lot bigger. And, you know, it's, it's underground, but it's like more bigger than what the movie shows it and where the movie shows it just like a, a big room with a lot of supplies. Uh. So as they walk with all their new supplies, this is where they finally encounter the only character with a name, Eli. Uh, So the boy convinces the man to give him some food. The boy pleads with him, come on, let's help this old man as he's walking. Because he can tell like he's blind or has cataracts or has difficulty seeing because his eyes are kind of grayed out. Uh, And after 
you know, reluctantly, uh, or, or the, the, the man is reluctantly that does decide to help the old man. Uh, they decide to have dinner together. Uh, and as they're kind of gathering their, their things together, the boy reaches out and holds the old man's hand. And this kind of, you know, makes the man uneasy, not the old man, but the, the father. So he kind of tells him, he's like, don't hold that old man's hand. And after some monologue between the man and the father, this is where you get some of the God references because they start talking about God and how God doesn't exist. I, and, and if God did exist, he turned his back on this world a long time ago. I feel that Eli is almost like an angel and because he has a name. He's old. They, you know... And he talks to the to the man, and they're talking about dying. And he goes, uh, he says something to the fact, dying is not a luxury that we have. And then right. he's talking about how there's no humanity left. Yet he's wandering around. This kid helps him. He pleads his dad to help him, and he gets the help. And. He goes, I, I don't see too well, but he does see when shit is bad. Like when he shows him the gun, he goes, yeah, I see that to me. So that means he, to me, it's almost like uh, an an angel or might be God himself. I mean, I don't know, but I have a feeling it's a biblical, it's somebody uh, from above who's just wandering the earth um, and just trying, testing as God always does, is to see what are these people going to do? Are they going to help me? And of course, they, the father's reluctant, but the kids, like, you know, being kids as uh, as honest as kids are, like, let's help them. We're the good guys. Right. Uh, Eli says something to the fact of uh, the boy reminds him of an angel, and yes. the man agrees. And even in, in the book, it goes more into it. Uh, the, the man makes mention of the boy is the voice of God in, in his mind and reminds him that God is out there and wants him to be good. And he still sees that innocence and that goodness in the boy. So I, I, I know you're, you were kind of a little harsh on the boy just, or more harsh on the man for not developing the boy. But I think this is where in the book, it explains it a little better that the man is trying to preserve this goodness, this goodness, godliness in the boy and where he wants to help a perfect old man stranger. He wants to preserve that as long as he wants and doesn't want him to be, uh, you know, kind of torn like the man is where you'll see later on he becomes very suspicious of everybody he comes across. Uh, so I, yeah. I, th I think the book kind of does a better Even uh, explanation them, of this than the movie. If, are you following me? And like, he's the one that walked up to him, which was very strange to me when he said that. Right. And you and see I'm that just, repeated throughout yeah. the, the movie uh, later on. Uh, but the very next scene we see uh, as the, the boy and the man kind of wander, wander into the woods, kind of looking for more supplies. You see a group of hunters and marauders chasing a woman and a child. They finally catch up to the woman and the child and kill them. Uh, trees are falling in the background. It's a scary moment for the boy as the forest around them is collapsing. Uh, they finally find shelter in a church. And here the man has another coughing fit. And the boy gets scared and pleads with the father to please stop coughing uh, because it's scaring him. And you kind of see that fear in the boy's face as he knows that eventually that the father is going to get too ill to be able to continue forward. Going real back to where that scene then real quick where the, the they're hunting that mother and father and then the earth starts coming up like it's like very violent scene with the murder and then what's going on with the earth. I think that's that's what I'm saying. Going back to Eli, it's like some like God's upset there. Like you, you got these this good kid here and, you know, and all this other crap is going on. And to me, that was like another potent scene. I'm like, well, OK. They just met you met Eli and he's crying. He sees an angel and all this to me. I'm just like that just goes to show you as soon as they leave, they go away from him. Bad shit's happening again. Right, right. Yeah, I could see that. I, I didn't think about it like that before. Uh, the very next scene, they finally make their their goal. They make it to the ocean shore 
uh, I thought it was kind of funny that the man apologizes that the ocean is not blue anymore. Yeah, because it has the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it has the same color as the sky. It's just all gray and, and you know kind of dull. Uh, at this point, uh, the movie makes a big deal. Uh, the book makes a bigger deal of this and kind of elaborates a little bit more. But the boy gets sick. Yes. And and the man tries to comfort him. You know, he kind of puts a shelter around him. And the book kind of goes more into detail on this because the, the boy almost ends up dying at this point. He throws up. Right. And in the book, it kind of goes more into it. He gets a fever. The man kind of has to try to find remedies to kind of help him. And it goes into a little bit more and where the movie kind of just brushes over it really quickly. Uh, at this point, um, the boy asked if the, uh, if, he, if he would die, what would the man do? Yeah. And then the man tells him, if, if you would die, I would die too. Uh, just to be with you. Uh, so I thought that was, you know, kind of sad where the boy was even seeing his own mortality at this point because he's being, you know, because he was sick. That the man says, don't worry, wherever you go, uh, you know, I'll I will go. I'll yeah. go stay with you. Uh, I think this is another point in the movie where it kind of goes a little quick, where the book kind of goes into more detail. And even the next scene, too, where uh, the man swims to a boat that's wrecked in the distance. Right. The the book, they stay there what seems like a week with this boat going back and forth. The man swims back and forth multiple times, bringing back supplies. He finds uh, a compass that they used to use for uh, traveling in the boat. And, and it's just like, like, a, like a whole long-term thing. Uh, and where the movie kind of makes it seem like they were only there for like an hour kind of thing. But the man yeah. swim, uh I'm sorry, the, the man uh, swims uh, to the boat. And at this point, the, the boy falls asleep. Uh, in the background, you see like a shadowy man uh, walking towards the camp. And then he ends up stealing everything, but doesn't harm the boy and doesn't disturb him. Which was uh, interesting to me. Knowing yeah, I how did. the world is and he just lets him there sleeping. Right. I did think that was weird at that point just because I didn't know what was going on. But um, it, it kind of made me feel bad for what's going to happen next. Um, so so at this point, the, the man returns from the boat, uh, wakes up the son and, and, and tells him what happened. What happened to all the supplies? Uh, somebody stole it, obviously, uh, it looks like. So they start running down the road to see if they can catch up to the man. Uh, here's where you see that the man brought back a flare from the boat. Right. So uh, they start running down the road trying to catch up to the man. And they finally do catch up to the man because he's, you know, hauling their cart full of supplies and he could only go so fast as the man and the boy are on foot and can catch up a lot faster. Uh, the man makes the thief take off all his clothes, take off his coat, his shoes, everything that he has, basically leaving them there to die. Uh, the man yeah. asks the man yeah. asks the thief why he was following them. And this is where, like you mentioned, where it's like a repeated theme where he's constantly asking, why are these people following me? But it's funny because he's the one that catches up to this man. Right. Uh, here is where uh, the boy and the man kind of have a little conflict because the boy is begging him for him not to do this. But the man is upset. The man's upset that in this world that they live in, this is what you need to do to survive. And the boy is not ready to do that. The boy is still being innocent. He still has that godly uh, aspect of him where he wants to help everybody out there. And he just wants to help this thief that just stole all of their supplies and maybe made them surviving a lot more difficult. But he still has the empathy for this man to try to give him something for him to survive. So after some time of the man and the boy shouting back and forth, the man, uh, you know, kind of tells the boy shouting at him. He's like, you don't have to worry about the future. I do. And then that's when the boy kind of finally, I think, takes a step in his development as to being maybe a little more a survivalist in him. And he yeah. shouts back to the man. No, I do. I have to worry about the future. Uh, so after breaking down the man, he finally leaves him some food, leaves him his clothes, and they wander off back on the road. Well, the dad should have whooped his ass in the beach when they let him steal all that shit. That was the, the man's first mistake. 
<laughs> and then uh, I got on my notes, uh, boy doesn't want to kill the man. Weakness, bro. Like, I'm with the dad on this one, but I, I get where the kid, <clears throat> he's going to learn quickly, man. Uh, you know, once his dad's gone, like, let's see how it goes. But uh, I'm like, good for him trying to be, protect, you know, be cool with everything. But I, that's where I kind of struggle with that. And by this point in the movie, I'm getting like annoyed with the kid. Right. Uh, but like I mentioned, speaking as a Christian man, I know it is difficult to be giving, especially in a heart, heart situation as that. But God teaches us to constantly be empathetic to people, constantly be helpful in no matter what the situation is. And I think this is where more of the God aspect is in this book and in the movie where the boy has that symbol of being a godly man and he tries to have empathy even though the situation is is bad you know this man just basically stole everything for them so that's where i kind of don't see this character is in a bad light as you do just because i see that godly person in him and i would want to try to shield that as much as possible as well uh so so now we're getting kind of closer to the end of the movie at this point uh, the man and the boy walk into a town with their supplies and they're just wheeling their cart along. Uh, and here's where the man's attacked. Uh, the man is hit with an arrow uh, and is hit in the leg from an upstairs window across the, the road. Uh, the man shoots the flare through the window uh, to try to hit whoever was trying to shoot him with the arrow. And at this time, you hear, you hear a commotion upstairs. The man starts going through the apartment complex, going up to the stairs where uh, the, where he got shot with the arrow. And that's where he finds a woman and the man he just killed laying on the floor. And the woman is, is you know, kind of like, why'd you do this? Why'd you do this? And this is where, again, Andy, you hear that, why were you following me? And yeah. the man's just like, no, you were following us. We were here, you know, protecting ourselves. And because you were walking up behind us, it appears they took cover, and that's when the man decided to shoot him with the arrow. So you see the paranoia in the man developing here, and, you know, a constant theme through the movie. Yeah, and I got real quick that it looks like they were at Myrtle Beach. And this is another thing I noticed about the kid. By this time in the movie, they're just walking, and the kid doesn't is not even sick no more. Because before, it, he was just, like, so worried about his son. And now they're just, like, doo -doo, walking, and he, the, the dad gets shot, you know. And I'm like, well, what happened to the kid? The kid got just fucking cured by preaching to the dad about this leave uh, this man his shoes and some fucking canned peaches or something. Right. I think the book kind of since it shows the sickness in a longer form, um, maybe you wouldn't have that feeling as bad. But, yeah, it, de it definitely is rushed. And this is the whole boat part, the whole him being sick. This is when I started feeling that the movie was being rushed. I don't know if more scenes were developed, but in order to trim time off, th they decided to cut a lot of this stuff at the end. But it, the movie could have helped; could have been helped out with uh, these scenes being developed a little bit right. more. Uh, so the man and boy, um, in in the very next scene, uh, he has another. The man has another coughing fit, and then this is where he finally kind of breaks down on the beach. Um, you know, and you could kind of see like these are the last moments of the man. So the boy kind of shelters him, and in the in the book it goes into more detail because they actually camp out for what seems a few days, and yes. where in the movie it's more like maybe just a day or a couple hours. But he kind of builds a shelter around them, puts blankets around the man, uh, and tries to you know make him comfortable as he's having these coughing fits and looks very pale and sick. Uh, the man tells the boy he can go no further. Uh, and at this point, uh, the man tells the boy, always carry the gun with you. Uh, no matter what, don't let anybody take this gun away from you. It's your protection. Uh, the boy tells the man uh, he wants to be with him, but the man apologizes uh, for having to leave him and having to finally die. Uh, the man asked the boy to hold his hand, and after a long night of, of the man laying there, he finally dies. So right. the, bo the boy kind of struggles with this, and uh, the movie kind of makes it kind of quick, but in the book, 
I, I believe he makes it like a day or two kind of lay next to his dead father, not knowing how to cope with the situation. But after some time, he finally decides to cover his father, gather some supplies and starts walking off. Yeah, that, that whole scene right there where after he, he dies in his sleep, they wake up. He starts grabbing, he grabs the gun, he grabs the binoculars and some, some other stuff. Then he just throws the blanket over him. And I'm just like, what the fuck, man? Is he going to bury his dad or what, man? He's a cold-hearted bastard here. And I'm just like, I got in my notes, no la chingue, bury your dad, exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, man, this man protected you your whole life at least you could bury him not have uh be picked at or uh because i that for the first in the movie when they got there they saw birds or something so i'm like yeah man i'm just like like i get it it's it, it, he has to he has to come to of age real quick but i, I would uh maybe he don't know that you bury people you know that you know something that just popped in my head uh, to me that scene was just like it was kind of upsetting that he didn't bury his dad. He just left them there. You know, that is a possibility. I never thought about that either until you just brought it up. Maybe he's not aware that you need to bury people. Uh, he just never because dealt with that. He's always dealt with people die. They get eaten, you know? I don't know. Like throughout the movie, there's scenes where he finds the bodies. Uh, he finds them in bed, you know. And then the dad goes to him, it's nothing you haven't seen before. So he's used to right. just seeing bodies all over the place. And maybe that, that's why I'm like, nothing about it now. He just doesn't know what to do with bodies. I mean, you know, because ain't, it, it ain't the civilized world. Right. And for me, I'm here like I'm fucking upset that he's just going to leave the body there. Right. I mean, the book kind of develops it a little bit more. They, they go into a little more of the this is where the book kind of changes into the inner monologue of the boy. And you kind of get to hear some of the boys' thoughts. So I think this is where the, the book kind of transitions a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, this is uh, close to the end of the movie, the, the very last scene. Uh, a, a stranger approaches in the distance. The, the stranger tells the boy that he is one of the good guys. And after having uh, some conversation, he finally asks the boy to come along with him. Uh, the boy asks the stranger if he's carrying the fire and you could kind of see uh, the the actor you mentioned, guy, uh, asking him like, "Man, you're," he's like, "Yeah, you're you're really messed up." But it, you know, he doesn't have a name in the movie. But yeah. the actor guy, um, he's just like, "You're kind of screwed up in the head, aren't you, boy?" And the boy's just like, you know, pulls the gun on him, and he's just like, "Just answer my question. Do you, are you carrying the fire?" And the man finally is like, "Yes, I am carrying the fire." He kind of asks some more follow up questions as far as you have family, do you have kids with you? And the the man, the new stranger, kind of reassures him and tells him, like, yes, we're uh, one of the good guys, and uh, I do have kids. Um, this is when uh, there's a final scene with the boy and his father, kind of giving his final goodbyes, uh, telling the father, I will always talk to you every day, yeah, uh, no matter what. Uh, gives him a final kiss in the cheek and covers him up for the final time walks up to the, the new family that he encountered, which has uh, two kids, uh, a mother and the, uh, the stranger father. Uh, and then that's when the mother lets him know. He's just like, we've been following you for days. And it's weird how the whole following thing is a theme throughout the movie. And in this time, there was somebody following him, but it was this family that was following. The man's uh, paranoia the paid off, man. He knew he was being followed. His instincts were correct. Right. And going back to this family real quick, I don't, I don't think you mentioned it when they were buried in that silo or that bunker. There was a scene or where they hear people walking, and the kid goes, "Do you hear that? That's a dog. That's a dog." And that's like, "You're crazy. There ain't no dog. And if there's a dog, that means there's not people, not too far behind them." And in the scene when he meets the guy. Uh, the new guy, the wife, or whatever, and the two kids. One, you see, it's the kid. I believe that he saw it when they were at his dad's were a house where they grew up. He grew right. up, and then he has a dog with him, a mangy mutt. But I'm like, well, oh, right away, I'm like, that's the family or the person that was walking around when they were in that bomb shelter. Right. I kind of think the same thing. Uh, that was the dog that was uh, kind of scratching into that door. So uh, if they would have just waited there a little longer, maybe they could have united with this family and it would have been a different outcome. 
but ultimately the the father passes away and now this the son is kind of left to fend for himself a little bit more but still with the the help of this family and and, and this is where in my head it's it's kind of more of the god aspect uh, god sent another protector for the kid so yeah. that even though he was forced for a moment to deal with the realities of his father passing away uh it, it, you know there's a saying that god never puts more on your shoulders than what you can handle and i i think this is where that kind of rings true where god sent another person to be his guardian so that he could be a kid a little longer with these other children from this family so even though some people i have read from uh other forums some people kind of shit on this ending I, I thought it was a somewhat fitting ending because how are you really going to end this movie anyways? It, it would be tough to end anyway. So I think this is the best you can do with the circumstances that you have. What are you going to have? The, the man and the boy just walk off and find like a paradise and that's how the movie ends. So it, for the message that they were trying to um, convey in this movie, I thought this was the best way to kind of end the movie. Well, yeah, I mean, for what it is, I, I didn't like the ending myself too much. He just finds his family, we've been following you. And I found it very strange. If there were good people, they would have came up to him sooner. But they didn't. So, I I guess, that's why I said, like, uh, I just didn't like that ending. Um, I, I It kind of makes me wonder if um, this stranger family had seen them interact with Eli and them interact with the thief yeah. or maybe them interact with the, the man killed in the apartment that they see all this transpire since they were walking behind them. Uh, it kind of makes me think that they see the goodness in the man or, or the goodness or bad in the man as, as well as the boy, because they do make mention that, you know, we saw you with your daddy. So they were aware of their relationship. It looked like, yeah, I mean, they knew what he did ask him, where's, the, where's that man that you were with? Or, uh, and he goes, the, yeah, he's my papa or whatever. And then, like, oh, he's your father. And then, um, so, again, you guys, what, what do you think, Danny? Are you going to recommend the movie or not? I, I, I recommend the book a lot more, but I thought the movie was serviceable. I towards the end, I think it's kind of rushed when they reach the ocean area uh, and where the book kind of settles in and you could still see that there's a few chapters left because it goes into more detail. This is where I kind of think the movie kind of rushes it a little bit, but I still think it's a very good movie uh, shows the innocence of a child and how that father tries to preserve it as long as he can as he struggles with dealing with the, the world that they live in. So you would recommend it then if somebody said uh, you need to watch this movie? I mean, it does have in Rotten Tomatoes, I think it's at 73% or something like that. So it's, it looks like some people kind of liked it. Yeah, the film, the film holds a 73 approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. So, right. it, I mean, it, is, it isn't completely shitted on, um, but it does have positive reviews from critics. So, like, again, I personally, I didn't. You heard my thoughts early in the episode. I, I don't recommend it. The book, I got to read the book, but uh, what I saw, I mean, it, it's a, I don't recommend it. If you got time, check it out, but uh, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Right. Uh, yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, I, I, I think it's a, a good movie. Um, if you're uh, a, a family man or a father or a mother, I think it very hits the heart uh, just with kind of relating to the situation that they're in. And I think it's something that will kind of ring close to those people's hearts. Well, you know, speaking of something that's close to your hearts, we got to end this episode. It was obviously a special episode. Uh, we went into great depth. Let us know what you guys think. Uh, about the book or the movie i mean send us anything you got at ffn questions at gmail.com guys but uh we want to thank you all for listening remember to follow freeform network on facebook and twitter on their freeform network like i said your reviews your thoughts uh any movie particularly you like this to review episode 
uh, show, anything, send them to ffnquestions at gmail.com. Don't forget to check out our webpage at freeformnetwork.podbean.com. There we have all the links to all the platforms we're on, YouTube, iTunes, Podbean. Subscribe, like, give us reviews, comments. We love uh, interacting with our listeners, and you know we're always uh, listening and reading thoughts, not thoughts, but comments. But uh, check it out. Hit the like button. Again, it's Freeform Radio. I have uh, Daniel here. Yes, sir. Go out there, eat a can of menudo. Eat while you can because the food's going to end sooner or later. <laughs> and me, myself here, I'm ready for the grid to go down. I got propane tanks, uh, a lot of... Uh, propane accessories. And accessories and salted uh, canned meats. Andy here. Uh, we want to thank you guys for listening. Check it out. Let us know. And we'll talk to you guys real soon. That was cool, Dad.